my beloved brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the coming of the signs of the end. And we all know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also prophesied so many things. Many of these have occurred and some of them have not yet occurred. These prophecies are divided into major signs of the hour and minor signs of the hour. The minor signs have all occurred. The major signs, we're waiting for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who will earn Jannah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us of many things we see in our lives right now. And I'm going to be making mention of a lot of the things where evil is made mention of, that it will spread. It will spread in such a big way. One might argue that there was evil already before the advent of Islam. They used to bury their daughters alive. They used to drink alcohol. They used to trade with women. They used to engage in immorality. They were so uh, dirty in terms of the way they worshipped and what they worshipped. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how victory was granted and belief was cleansed within Makkah al Mukarramah, which was the hub of belief at the time, the hub of the worshipping places at the time. So much so that in Yemen, which is the south of Makkah al Mukarramah, there was a king known as Abraha. And he had created a place of worship that no one was coming to because they all used to go to Mecca. This was the popularity of Mecca. This was a dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam from the beginning. وَجَعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ O oh Allah, make the hearts of the people inclined towards them. Being Speaking about the people of Mecca and speaking about Mecca itself. So the hearts of the people from the beginning, from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, they had some connection with Mecca. It was a place that everyone wanted to go. I have spoken to dozens of non-Muslims who have shown an interest to go to Mecca to Mukarramah just by having seen it on the television, just by having heard about it. They want to go there. Now, I know, let me just say it because I spoke about it. Why? Is it that the non-Muslims are not allowed to go there? Well, according to some of the schools of thought, they are allowed to go. According to other schools of thought, if there is a necessity, they are allowed to go. And according to some of the schools of thought, they're not allowed to go. But in my mind and your minds, I'm sure because of the situation today, we would know immediately that, okay, if you're a non-Muslim, they won't allow you to go to Mecca. I can give you a logical reason, logic. How many Muslims are there on the globe? Arguably, two billion, right? How many people want to go to Mecca? Arguably, perhaps 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. Do you agree? How much space is there in Mecca? Maybe maximum for two million. These are only Muslims who believe it is sacred to go there. If you're going to open the door for tourism, Trust me, the Muslims themselves won't get a chance to go for pilgrimage. There's no place. There's no space. How many people want to go for Hajj? There's no place for them. There, are, there is a quota system. The quota system means you need to apply to go for Hajj. They might accept the application 20 to 30 years later. Imagine if you had to open the door for those who don't even believe it's sacred. So it's logical to say, listen guys, Please excuse us. There are people who really believe it is absolutely sacred to go to Mecca. Even they don't get a chance. It's only important and fair for us to give them a chance before anyone else. Like the Vatican, for example. If billions of Christians wanted to go there, I'm sure they would get preference over people of a different faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand things. So when you respond to a non-Muslim, don't come and say haram because the Quran says it's haram. Whereas... That may be factual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in the Quran. Indeed. And Allah and the Prophet sallallahu speaks about it in the hadith without a doubt. But you need to know when Allah says something, there is a reason. When the Prophet sallallahu says something, there is a reason. It's not just for nothing. There is a reason. 
and sometimes it is best to answer things logically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. One of the signs of Qiyamah, one of the signs of evil that the Prophet sallallahu speaks about, he says, people will be ignorant because the knowledgeable will be taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through death. So the ulama, those whom we consider scholars, will die one after the other. And then the ignorant will remain and people will consider the ignorant knowledgeable. They will ask the ignorant questions and they will seek guidance from them. These people who are astray themselves will respond with an answer that is actually wrong. They will be astray and they will lead others astray. The answer will come, but it is a wrong answer. So knowledge will go. And one of the first topics that will actually be depleted in terms of knowledge, people won't know anything about it, is a topic that is mentioned in detail in the Quran. What is it? It is known as Al-Mawarith or Al-Mirath, inheritance, the laws of inheritance in Islam. People will ignore, people will not know. The Hadith says there will come a time when two people will argue over a share in the estate of the deceased and they won't have anyone to guide them as to what the ruling is. It's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He speaks about it. So it's important for you and I to make sure that we learn. We learn. It is natural that every one of us wants to push the hour a little bit further away. That's natural. You know, I've only ever met one young man who told me, I wish Qiyamah was tomorrow. This whole problem would be sorted out. The rest of the world says, hey, you know what? Sign of Qiyamah, very bad. We need to stop this because we want Qiyamah to be further away. I still need to get married. I still need to have perhaps children. I still need to see my children getting married. And I still need to see them having children. And I said, you know what? Listen to me. You will be married. It won't be enough. You will have children. It won't be enough. Your children will be married. You will still want to see them have children. When your children's children are born, you will want to see them married. And when they are married, you will say, Oh Allah, let me be a great, great grandfather. Keep me alive. So it never ends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't keep it in your hands or in mine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we've decided. We've decided. But getting back to the point, knowledge is absolutely important. Spend time learning, understanding, put it into practice. And why I started off with this issue of inheritance is because of another misunderstanding. I spoke about non-Muslims not going to Makkah al Mukarramah and I gave you a logical answer which nobody can argue with. No one can argue with that. It's a fact. We show statistics and we are proving to you. But when it comes to the laws of inheritance, there will be people who will claim that what a woman gets is very unfair. It's not fair. She's getting half of a man. But they don't realize when you implement the entire system, she actually gets more than the man. And I want to give you an example. I've done it in the past, but this is a topic that we need to know. When a man dies leaving behind a son and a daughter, the son, if there was 75,000 US dollars, the son would get 50,000 US dollars and the daughter would get half of that, that is 25,000 US dollars. But, According to the Islamic system, that son, if he is the closest male relative to that daughter of the same man who passed away, he needs to take care of her basic necessities, food, accommodation, clothing. So his 25, his 70, uh, sorry, from the 75, his 50,000, he has to look after himself, perhaps his wife, perhaps his children. And on top of that, his sister, the same one who collected 25,000. It's wrong for him to say, you've got 25, use it. I don't want to know anything about you. So his 50,000 will be divided by four or five. And what about her 25? It's hers on her own. Mashallah. To go and eat out every weekend. Subhanallah. And enjoy and come back and say, hey, I need money because of my medical expense. Where is the honor? You tell me who was honored there, the male or the female, the female. And this is why in the laws of inheritance that Allah has stipulated, there is something interesting you will find. And that is 
every time the male relative is more distant if the closest male relative to the female who is survive who has who is one of the heirs for example is distant she gets a bigger share she gets a bigger share like for example if a man dies leaving behind two daughters and he has no sons so the closest person might be an uncle allah says no uncle gets very little that's if it even gets to him but they will get 66.6% two thirds of what the father leaves and that is compulsory no male's share is ever that big a percentage never how come they are getting 66.6% two thirds of his of the estate goes to these two girls it's because the closest male relative is a little bit distant there is a chance that he might not want to look after them he is still sinful for not having looked after them but it's just to protect them a little bit more where is the honor who got the honor the females the same applies if there's just one daughter she gets 50% of the entire estate for herself on top of that the closest male relative must look after her for her necessities and she will get 50% because the closest male relative to her is not so close in terms of relation i hope you understand this and the reason i say this is learn these rules when you know them it shows that the hour will be a little bit distant people ask me you're going to be talking about the, the hour so when when do you think it's going to be <laughs> do you think i'm going to look at my clock and say 5 uh, o'clock you know no way it's not that it's perhaps hundreds of years maybe away maybe not i don't know if the prophet peace be upon him said mal mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min as-sa'il the one who is asking the question knows the one who is being asked the question knows no more than the one who was asked the one who is being asked the question knows no more than the one who is asking that's what it is i say it again in arabic it's so beautiful you cannot get confused but in the english language you can mal mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min as-sa'il the one who is being asked the question knows no more than the one who is asking simple now i hope you get it inshallah if that was the prophet muhammad peace be upon him saying that how can i answer differently and say the mahdi was born 20 years ago there's 20 years left in fact in 2020 he's going to show himself in hajj and that's it they've been saying that since i was a kid mahdi was born a million times i promise you he's been being born ever since i don't know the 500 years after the prophet sallallahu alaihi so many times people are saying i'm the mahdi you say okay wow what does that mean may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and grant us ease i remember one man got up and he says i'm the mahdi you know sometimes when people suffer psychologically they begin to believe that they are somehow you know superhuman beings and they start thinking they are the mahdi and they announce it that i'm a mahdi you know and what happened is the one of the imams of the haram says okay so do you speak arabic he says no he says mahdi don't speak arabic Mahdi do you read Quran he says no i don't i can't read the arabic he says mahdi and you don't read the quran go and learn maybe you can try later to fool the people may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease that's a sign of the hour it's a sign of the hour ignorance ignorance is indeed one of the prophecies it is very evil because you will not know how to protect yourself from evil if you don't have knowledge araftu sharra li uwaqihi wa man lam ya'rif sharra yaqa fihi I learned about evil in order to protect myself from it whoever doesn't know what evil is will fall straight into it if i don't know what is halal and haram what will happen i'll be eating things i'll be consuming things i'll be earning in a haram way without even knowing how did i save myself that brings me to another sign of the hour the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says a time will come la yubali almar'u amin alhalal akala am min alharam a person will not be bothered whether he is eating from halal or from haram they won't be bothered at all i'm not worried don't we see that today halal and haram is not only about food but yes a large chunk of it has to do with food today we will go anywhere we fly anywhere to any country and all we are interested in is makan 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 that's it makan makan you know one malaysian actually thought that makka was makan Allahu akbar i had to say this is not makan this is makka ha ha it's not an n at the end it's an h you know someone must have put that little uh, you know the h with a slightly shorter hand there 
and they thought it's Makkan. Oh, there must be a lot of food. I've heard there's KFC there, McDonald's there, everything else. A'udhu Billah, Astaghfirullah. That's not how it is. My brothers and sisters, it's not all about food. It's got to do with what is halal, what is permissible. You will not die if you don't eat beef. You will not die if you don't eat chicken. You will not die if you don't eat that which perhaps is questionable. There are other things that no one will question. Yes, when something is halal, don't label it haram. Remember that. Because the Quran speaks about it. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُ أَلْسِنَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ Don't utter with your tongues the falsehood that this is halal, this is haram in order to fabricate lies against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from yourselves. Halal and haram is determined by Allah. And Allah says, وَمَا لَكُمْ أَلَّا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ What is wrong with you that you do not want to consume that which is halal, that which the name of Allah has been called upon its slaughter and so on. What is wrong with you? You don't consume that. What does this mean? This means you cannot say something that is halal is haram. The same applies. You cannot say something that is haram is halal. Now there is a gray area in between. There will be something some people are arguing. Is it halal? Some say it is. Haram? Some say it is. What do you do? You're in the middle. You either have knowledge. If you have knowledge, one of the two directions, you follow that knowledge. These people are saying it's haram, but I know that it's permissible. It's halal. Or these people are saying this is halal, but I have more knowledge than them in this particular regard and I'm telling you that it is actually haram. If you have that knowledge, you don't have any doubts. Follow the knowledge. But the question is when you are doubting, what do you do? Well, the sunnah is complete. The Prophet ﷺ has spoken about it in hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu an. I'm sure we've heard it so many times if you've been following Islamic talks closely or Islamic guidance. إِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنْ وَإِنَّ الْحَرَامَ بَيِّنْ وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مُشْتَبِهَاتٌ لَا يَعْلَمُهُنَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ Hadith, long hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ says, the halal is clear, the haram is clear. In the middle, there are certain things that are not so clear, doubtful things that many people don't know. The benefit of the statement, many people don't know, it actually means some people know. Those people who know, we spoke about them a few seconds ago. You follow what you know. Those who don't know, the hadith says, فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبُهَاتِ فَقَدِ اسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ Whoever has stayed away from that which they don't know about, they have protected themselves because they haven't even gone into the probability of having consumed that which was not permissible. Meat in front of me. Someone says halal, someone says haram. I am confused. If I eat it, I got into the chance of having eaten haram. But the hadith says, if you did not eat it, nobody can say you were wrong. I didn't eat it. What did you have? I had vegetables. Make sure they were not cooked with wines. Huh. Allahu Akbar. You know, today that can happen. They say vegan, vegetarian. Not necessarily. There could be wine in there. You know, it's part and parcel of that. So be careful. But going back to the point, the hadith says, فَمَنْ وَقَعَ فِي الشُّبُهَاتِ وَقَعَ فِي الْحَرَامِ Whoever falls into that which is doubtful in the middle, that which they don't know about, they have fallen into haram because they were ready to, they were ready to take a risk regarding an item just for a burger. Come on, a burger. You could have done without it. I know there was tomato sauce, ketchup. I know there was beautiful mayonnaise, you know, dripping out of there. I know there were beautiful tomatoes and beautiful, and in some languages, in some accents, they say tomatoes. And I know that there was lettuce and I know there was everything in there. And I know it looked so nice and I know you were hungry. But if you feared Allah, you would say, I opt for a vegetarian meal. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And here we are talking about when you're in doubt. You know, Malaysia, you are so lucky. You have a system that governs all of this from the top to make sure that nothing is going wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them all goodness. Whoever is sacrificing to make sure that that system works correctly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Wallahi, you only appreciate a system when it's no longer there in most cases. So at least appreciate this one while it's there. And believe me that when it's not there, then you start saying, hey, I wish we had a system like this and like that without realizing. So this is halal and haram. A sign of the hour is people won't be bothered. They will be 
evil will spread to the degree that people will consume anything and everything. They wouldn't be worried. Riba. Riba is interest and usury. People will call it a different name. The hadith says there will come a time when they'll consider it permissible. Call it another name. They call it bakhshish in some places. That means a gift. You know, when I first heard the word bakhshish, when I was very young, not too long after that, I heard the word hashish and I thought they were relatives. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They both had the shishas in it. And a little bit later, the shisha itself came out. Imagine, imagine. And the Muslims were found with all of those. And they're still calling themselves Muslimin. It's a sign of the hour. Life is not all about sitting in a shisha lounge and puffing away and thinking that you're going to heaven. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a little bit more serious about our lives and even more serious about our death. You need to prepare for the akhirah. I'm not saying don't enjoy yourselves. Make sure it's clean fun. It doesn't have to be dirty. It doesn't have to be something, you know, people like to puff. You put in a cigarette in your mouth, you pull it in. I know one uncle used to make rings. You know, you have onion rings. He makes smoke rings. And the ring comes out. He says, oh, look at that. Look at that. And another ring comes out. Look at that. Allahu Akbar. That doesn't make it halal. As interesting as it is, it's still bad for your health. It's evil. My brothers and sisters, quit the bad habits and you will, inshallah, be contributing not only towards your own benefit, but society and community at large, the ummah at large. Remember this, qiyamah will not take place until Allah's anger is so much that there won't even be a single person on earth saying Allah, Allah. This means one of the signs of the hour, no one's going to read salah. So when you are now lazy, you don't want to pray, you sit back, you relax. Ah, it's okay. You know, I heard this morning, Allah is ghafoorul rahim, Allah is forgiving. I'm sure he knows that I need to sleep because I need to go to work. Whoa. You don't know today, before you go to work, Allah is going to take you away back. This was your last chance to read your salah and you didn't. This is why there will come a time when people won't even read salah. They won't even say Allah's name. They will be ashamed. They won't say Allah. So you won't hear anyone remembering Allah, talking about Allah. No salah, no zakah, no hajj, no nothing. Because there won't be anyone saying Allah, Allah, according to the hadith. The anger of Allah will take over to the degree that he will declare that the trumpet be blown and the world will come to an end. Everything will be destroyed completely to smithereens. Allah will not destroy anything unless it deserves to be destroyed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not cause the world to end if there is even a single person who's worshiping him. So you and I do not want to become statistics. Remember that we don't want to be moving signs of Qiyamah. Every time you are lazy with your Salah, you are a person. Remember the next generation will be even more lazier than you, even more lazy than you. Remember this. So fulfill it. Get up for the sake of Allah. How long does it take? It doesn't take too long. There will be people who will abandon reading the Quran. They will abandon it. My brothers and sisters, I want you to answer me with a show of hands. How many of you in your mobile phones do you have an application where you can read the Quran in? Put up your hands high. I see almost null exception. Everyone, shukran. Everyone has it. Now I want to ask you, how many of you Use that app to read the Quran every day, at least once. Put up your hand high. I see one tenth of the hands. Allahu Akbar. Congratulations. It's a bigger figure than I was expecting. It shows we are still further away from Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. At least people are reading the Quran. You might argue, okay, I don't read it on the app. I read it maybe, you know, using the Mus'haf, which is a greater reward, for example, because for that you need wudu. You need to be on a higher level of purity. If you're reading from your phone, you know, according to some of the scholars, you wouldn't really need to have wudu as such. The, the, you know, the level of purity, it can be slightly lower because it's not a Mus'haf. But when you open the Mus'haf, the reason why the scholars say there is a greater reward when you open the Mus'haf itself is because you need to be on a higher level of purity. That's one of the reasons. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Either way, I don't want to say this or that. I want to say, read the Quran, whether it's here or there or on an app or even on the walls in the masjid. You know, when you go into the masjid, my little son asked me once when we went to Medina Munawwara, what's all this Arabic writing on the wall? 
I said it's Surah Yasin. Look at it. It starts from here. It goes all the way around the whole Haram and they finish it. And it's actually more than that. It goes on and on and on. He said, but why do they write it on the wall? It, isn't it in the Quran? I said, yeah, so why do they have to write it on the wall? Now, you know, me and my logical answers. I said, you know what, son? Some people are too lazy to open the book. <laughs> and the son was too sharp. He tells me, but dad, that means that they're only going to read one ayah because from this wall to that wall, there's only one verse. I said, well, one verse is, is good enough, isn't it? Mm, I don't think you'd be, you're telling me the truth, you know? But the point being raised is even if you're reading it off a wall, a lot of us in our houses, we have plaques. These plaques have verses of the Quran. Some of the scholars actually say that's not good. You, you are perhaps insulting the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by hanging it. I want to say if you have it hung, at least read it. At least read it. We have the 99 names of Allah for the last 30 years hanging in our lounge and we still don't know them off by heart. Come on. Spend a little bit of time when you enter the lounge, 99 names. We take pictures of it. We put it on the Snapchat story that we started using a few days ago, mashallah. And what happens? Everything starts flowing. Oh, my house. I've got this Islamic artwork, this artwork. I've had the 99 names of Allah, this surah, that surah, everything is here. But I've never read it. I just take pictures of it and put it online. Like the people who enter a store and they test all the clothes in the store. They take all the pictures and show them all over Facebook and everywhere else. But those clothes do not belong to them. They didn't buy them. No one knows that they were only testing them. They put them back. And the whole world thinks, wow, rich lady, everyday new pair of shoes. No, I pass by, you know, the, the, the store that sells shoes every day. And I just take pictures with a different pair. Allahu Akbar. That's what we are doing when it comes to religious matters as well. It's all about photographs. It's all about a show and nothing in reality. It's a life full of show. That's why the hadith says there will come a time nothing will remain of Islam except the name. Nothing will remain of the Quran except the print, the drawing, you know, the words. That's it. The masajid will be built well and possibly even well attended. But people will enter and exit ceremonially. You enter the masjid like a ceremony. You exit, you achieve nothing. It was just a ceremony. I went to get over and done with something, but I came out without achieving anything much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So let's go back to this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu speaks about intoxicants. He speaks about there will come a time when people of my ummah will consider adultery permissible. They might call it different names. They might do different things, but they will consider it permissible. Call it mut'a, call it whatever you want. But adultery is adultery. Fornication is fornication. Immorality is immorality. Remember that. The names that people may call it irrelevant. The hadith says people will consider it permissible. Yastahilluna al-hira. Yastahilluna Al-Hira You know what Al-Hira means? It means a zina It means immorality, evil Sexual misconduct They will consider it halal That's the meaning of the term Istihlal Yastahillun And the hadith continues to say Wal-Harira That's very very interesting The hadith says People will consider the wearing of silk permissible What does that mean? What does the Prophet ﷺ mean when he says that? He means for men it is prohibited to wear silk. That's what he says. You know, the Prophet ﷺ once had silk in one hand and gold in the other. And he said, ala ummati. These two are prohibited for the males of my ummah. That's what he said. So you and I know the two are prohibited. Then he said there will come a time when the males will consider from my ummah, the males will consider silk and to wear it permissible. It's a sign of the hour. So the scholars have made mention of a very, very interesting point. They say female clothing will be worn by males and male clothing will be worn by females. Swapping of clothing. Because Al-Harira is supposed to be feminine. For women it's permissible to wear silk. It's part of their beauty, adornment and gold and so on. 
jewelry is for women adornment beautification that's for women and then when men start considering it permissible nothing wrong so you have men wearing a dress and they say nothing wrong with this what's wrong why are you looking at me subhanallah okay mine is a little bit long alhamdulillah but you have i'm talking of female clothing male clothing you and i know over time the dress codes have changed how the prophecy of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came true how amazing dress code has changed to the degree that our grandmothers and in most cases our own mothers if they are beyond the age of 50 we would never dream that they wore some of what our daughters are wearing today subhanallah and people buy stuff it's just called oh this is unisex i'm not saying it's always haram please don't get me wrong but if it is something that belongs to the females and the males are wearing it it's part of this hadith and if there is something that belongs to the males and the females are wearing it it's part of this hadith i'm not condemning any specific clothing but i'm just telling you the mixing of clothing be careful this is why in islam if you are a very modest person and you are concerned about these matters as a male you wear masculine clothing and as a female you make sure it's feminine clothing that's just a good muslima for you i'm not saying the others are bad but i am saying these are a little bit more conscious when it comes to clothing may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding i wouldn't ever want to arrive on the day of qiyamah and be thrown in with the group of people who are known as these are the people who were the statistics of the last hour allahu akbar may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness then the same narration speaks about ma'azif this hadith is in sahih al bukhari the hadith started off by speaking about adultery people will consider it permissible maybe give it different names sahih al bukhari the next part the hadith says regarding clothing and i told you silk the third part speaks about musical instruments al ma'azifa there is one meaning to it al ma'azif musical instruments people will consider them permissible so one might ask well so what is the ruling The reality is my brothers and sisters I know today there is a huge debate about music. I want to mention again we spoke about logic a little bit earlier. We know from a religious perspective the ruling. Let's speak about from a logical perspective. Wallahi now I have done my own little research with non-Muslims. And I have asked religious non-Muslims. I'm talking of Christians and Jews and Hindus etc. naming top pop stars from the music industry. Would you allow your children to listen to this person? Never. Would you allow them this? Never. Would you allow them that? Never. Why? It's dirty, it's immoral, it's filthy, it's degrading and it's unacceptable not in my home. But you're a Christian, I know. Not allowed. But you're a Jew, not allowed in my home. But you're a Hindu, never. Not with my children. Why? Because the industry is dirty. That's what it is. So people argue no, there is maybe perhaps I do agree. perhaps the duff is permissible within certain limits within certain limits perhaps if you are singing an islamic song with beautiful meanings perhaps within limits there is a certain permissibility but here i'm speaking of the musical instruments and the music industry whereby people start shaking i don't even know what it comes naturally they say it's natural it's not natural it's shaitan's way of controlling you you listen to the beat the beat continues you start tapping your finger you start moving your head a little while later you start moving the top of your body and a little while later you start moving the bottom of it may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and the words have become so dirty my brothers and sisters that it is a sign of the hour and people say nothing wrong my brother you have a beard that reaches the ground and you still bopping astaghfirullah may allah forgive you and forgive all of us you cannot do that we need to be careful i want to teach you something very very beautiful why don't you replace that with the quran melodious recitation listen to ra'd al-kurdi listen to anyone else that you would perhaps like sa'd al-ghamidi beautiful recitals of your choice abdul basit abdul samad whoever else you like there will be so many people replace it it's beautiful it's soothing go on to youtube and check how the non muslims reacted to a a a survey or a little test an experiment that was done where they were told to listen to this 
Quran without knowing it's the Quran and comment about it. Wallahi, now in Europe, the test was done recently and a lot of them say, it's so calm, it's so cool, it's so soothing. I feel spiritual. Go and listen to the answers. It's their life for everyone to see. And we Muslims who have the Quran, we are not achieving any soothing, no comfort, no nothing from this. How and why? Surely you can replace it. I would rather be resurrected and arrive in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having known as a person who gave up dirty music for the words of yours oh Allah I didn't want to listen to all of this I gave it up I know there was a debate about halal haram I do know the majority of the scholars said it's not permissible I do know some of them said okay within a certain scope it's okay but remember those who say within a certain scope it's okay none of them say that the musical industry of today is permissible not even one of them remember that I would rather come in front of Allah and be resurrected as a person who just substituted all of this for the Quran. Allahu Akbar. I substituted all of it for beautiful Islamic talks and that which motivated me, it calmed me down. Subhanallah, you listen. I listen sometimes to beautiful words that are being said by beautiful people who want to promote goodness. And I just smile to myself. I say, mashallah, look at this. I just smile to myself. You know, sometimes you hear your own jokes. Astaghfirullah. They are sent to you by someone. And you laugh at it. Did I really say this? I can't believe it. Subhanallah. Did I really say this in my talk? Can't believe it. But it happens. It's something good because at least it makes you smile. Subhanallah. You start relating. You feel, wow. You feel good about yourself. That's what it's all about. I'm a Muslim. I'm trying. And inshallah, yes, it's a real world out there. It's not that, okay, the religious people have to stand at the top and say, guys, you better follow the deen. Guys, you better follow. No, no, no. We're all standing on one platform and we all want to remind each other, inshallah. So listen to some beautiful things. My brothers and sisters, this will help you in this world and the next. So it's like alcohol. When alcohol was made prohibited, it was prohibited in stages. Those who were sharp, they understood A. When Allah says there is more evil than good, let me quit it, let me cut it, let me not even participate in this because I'd rather do something that there is more good in than to do something that there is more bad in. The same rule can be applied to some other habits that we have today. You know, the phone, obviously now this is not a sign of the hour, but this is something else. It could be by extension. The phone distracts us from a lot of our duties unto Allah. The phone distracts us from our duties unto our children and our spouses. When you enter the home, have a bin where you place all your phones, go in. If you want to be on your phone, pick it up, stand just outside your door in the cold or in the heat. Unless it is necessary. When I said this in one of my talks, everyone said, well, it's necessary. Allahu Akbar, necessary. The point is, learn to control yourself. Do something. If your child was 2 o'clock in the morning on the phone, not sleeping, what would you do? Turn off the Wi-Fi. Then the child gets up and starts banging and hitting and everything else. Well, you need to set an example. You need to put your phone away. That's what it is. Be disciplined yourself. Then your children will follow from the beginning. Play with your children. Take them out to play a game. Take them to the park. Go swimming with them. Do something constructive with them. They will become real children. But because you are on the phone all day, your children are on the phone all night. There we are. And who's to blame? You. You didn't play with them. You didn't interact with them. You didn't talk to them. Look at how depressing it has become to have your meals today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Going back to the signs of the hour. The hadith speaks about al-khamra, khamr. I spoke about it, intoxicants, all forms of intoxicants, whether it is weed, whether it is something else. If it is intoxicant and intoxicant, it is being referred to in the hadith. People will consider it permissible. I know of Muslims who say there's nothing wrong with weed, nothing at all. You know that we have now said that the only weed permissible is tajweed. You know that. We've said it a lot of times. But people say, no, nothing wrong. Soon they'll say cocaine, nothing wrong. Cocaine, what's wrong with it? Heroin, nothing wrong with it. That's what they will say. Astaghfirullah. You cannot allow these statements, but it starts off somewhere and it becomes worse. The hadith speaks about nudity. There will come a time when women will dress in order to expose. Wow. Kasiyatin ariyatin. These are the two words that are used. Together, they may sound contradictory. Kasiyatin means they are covered. Ariyatin means they are nude, exposed. So the meaning of it is 
Some people wear clothing in order to cover themselves. Those are the Muslimin. Some people wear clothing in order to expose themselves. Those are either the weak ones or perhaps they may not even be Muslim. So ask yourself when you are dressing, male and female, this hadith is referring to the females, but the males are included when it comes to giving importance to your dress code. You know, you cannot wear a jeans halfway down your legs now. You know, before it was halfway down your backside. <laughs> now it's halfway down your legs, meaning almost at your knees. Subhanallah, I remember, I remember someone sent me an image on WhatsApp once and it showed the men. They say in 1960, they used to wear their trousers up to just below their chest, you know, just below their ribs. And then 1970, it went a little bit lower. 1980, it got to the navel. 1990, it went just below the navel. And then, you know, 2000, it came to halfway down the backside. 2010, it came to the knees. 2020, now what they have, 2020, they got a guy walking with his underpants. He's got a little string and he's got his trousers behind him and he's walking with the trouser one meter behind him. I actually have that image. Subhanallah. In fact, it's a short little video clip. Some of you might have seen it. It's a reality. Things are becoming worse. Males think they can get away because every time we are speaking about dress, we are referring to the females. No way. We are referring to the males to begin with and then the females. But the hadith says, Kasiyatin ariyat. You know what that means? They are covered. They have dressed in order to show. So it's tight. So tight that you know what? It can even tear. Astaghfirullah. That's how tight it is. A'udhu billah. So tight that you can't even walk. So high heels that you, can, you don't, you're struggling to walk. Your feet have developed calluses, but you're not worried. It's a sign of the hour. You're supposed to wear shoes in order to be able to walk, not in order to be able to make a noise with them so that everyone can see, wow, high heels, you know. Astaghfirullah. Learn, my brothers and sisters. It's important. Go back to the reason why you got to do things. You wear clothing in order to cover, not in order to expose. So people wear, you know, Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. May Allah forgive us all. You wouldn't want to see a female dressed and you think, mashallah, she's covered head to toe. And as she walks past, you look back. Well, why were you looking back? But that we'll discuss later. You look back and you see a slit, subhanallah, from the bottom going all the way to the top. What was the point of this big long dress? When you just wore it to expose. That was a sign of Qiyamah. No wonder why the guy looked back. Astaghfirullah. No, I'm not justifying it. I'm not justifying. But I'm just trying to raise a point. To say, my brothers and sisters, let's become more conscious of this. We don't want to be part of these ahadith of Rasulullah He speaks about evil. The evil that will spread. The adultery that will spread. I touched on it in a previous talk of mine here. Such that sexual misconduct or immorality. People will be engaging in sexual activity in full view of the public and they won't mind. And the people there, the best from amongst them, the best statement that they would be able to utter is, hey, you know what guys, there's a wall there. Why don't you go behind the wall? Astaghfirullah. Imagine how it's going to become. You and I can see we're getting there. We're getting there. The way people are behaving, Allahu Akbar. Do you know there's a narration that states, there's a narration that states that there will come a time when people will take greater care of their dogs than they do of children. Do you know that? That is a prophecy that I witness. I once read an article where someone left $35 million estate for the dog. I almost started saying, ah, ah. <laughs> Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> I didn't expect that from myself either. <laughs> The point being raised is, look at the dog. Even human beings would think, 35 million, come on, man. This dog is so lucky. What are they going to do? Subhanallah, what are they going to do with this? We're taking more care of the animals than we are of human beings. In Islam, yes, you must be compassionate towards animals, but prioritize. Human beings come first. We want to save all the dogs of the world, but we don't want to save the brothers and sisters in Syria, for example, or the refugees that are out there and all the others who are struggling. But the dogs, we are quick to donate a thousand every month. Allahu Akbar. Where is the balance? Prioritize. If a dog is drowning and a human being is drowning, we want to save both. We must. That's our intention. But we start off with the human being. 
Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Now I don't know why you're laughing. You expected me to say, unless it's your mother-in-law. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. No, no, no. Subhanallah. I have the most awesome mother-in-law. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. I'm just setting the record straight. But my brothers and sisters, remember this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with so much. These are evil things. We don't want to be a party to these things. The Prophet sallallahu speaks about how falsehood will spread. And I will end on this note. Falsehood will spread such that when a person is telling a lie, they will be considered truthful. When people are speaking the truth, they will be considered liars. Today, if you take a look just at the media, whether it's social media or genuine, you know, the print media and perhaps television, etc. You can never ever believe even what you see with your eyes because it could be doctored completely. It could be photoshopped completely. You get a voice imitator now where you say things and you have the voice that you want to be imitated and it will say the same words in, a, in another voice. It's a little application. That's it. So now even when I hear someone say something, I don't necessarily have a guarantee in my heart that this is the actual person having said it. They have a face of a girl and they have a nude body and they are trying to blackmail the girl, not making it clear that this is photoshopped. The body is someone else's, the face is someone else's, the two are brought together. It is happening on the globe. Destruction of marriages, embarrassing people and so on and so forth. It's a sign of the hour. The Prophet says, that which is the truth will be considered false. That which is the lie will be considered completely truthful. Subhanallah. Be careful. Let us all become truthful. They say, when you are truthful yourself, you will be able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in tattaqu Allah yaj'al lakum furqana. O you who believe, if you are conscious of Allah, Allah will give you the ability to distinguish between the truth and falsehood, between right and wrong, and so on. Allah will grant you the ability to distinguish to separate the two sides, you will know. That's only when you're conscious of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us more conscious of Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May He make us from among those who have heard what was said and all the evil. May we be from among those who are not a party to this evil. And may we be from among those who abstain from evil. May we be from among those who promote goodness, morality, very, very high levels of character and conduct. Remember, the higher the level you promote and you live by, the greater the chances of the next generation living by something similar. Because every time something happens, the next generation actually drops one level. Ma'rufu zamanina. In fact, what is said, Ma'rufu zamanina munkaru zamanin qad mada. That which we consider acceptable today, there was a time when people considered it taboo, unacceptable. And that which is considered unacceptable today, there will come a time when people will consider it acceptable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep us guided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha.